Charlie Van. Welcome to Bits and Bytes 2, Program 2. Microsoft Word. I thought we did word processing last time. Well, you saw how to save a document to your hard disk and retrieve it, yes. Well, it's only a glorified typewriter. What else is there to know? I know how to type. Okay. Type a sentence. Let's say you're starting to put together a flyer for your hot air balloon company. All right. Now is the time for all good men. Keep there. Stop right there. Oh, why do you keep hitting enter at the end of the line? Well, it's the carriage return. <laughs> no, I'm afraid not. Word processors don't have carriage returns. They automatically wrap the words around at the end of the line. Oh. Suppose you want to add a word, say, uh, turbocharge, to describe your balloons. Move the cursor in front of hot air balloons and type it. Hey, that's neat. Or you want to cut never to be repeated, for instance. Hold down, delete. Hyper neat. Now, that's just the beginning. Suppose you've finished your flyer. Oh, okay. With a good word processor, you can really make the words dance. Double spacing, triple spacing. Two columns, three columns, four columns. Narrower. Justify, unjustify. Increase point size. Decrease point size. Bold, italics, underline, border, numbers, bullets, Times New Roman, aardvark, Arabic, architect, machine, Banff, cottage, Lincoln, New Yorker, Frankenstein, courier, Dawn Castle, present, stamp, Times New Roman. I could do all that with Microsoft Word? You could do all that with any good word processing program. It's certainly impressive. Well, let's see what word processing is really all about. Word processing was originally designed in order to remove the necessity to have to retype long reports or long documents just because of a few changes. But that means it's critical that the document be mutable, be changeable that it be easily changed. And in order to do that, you want to make sure that as much of not only the text, but the formatting intent of the author has been captured. One example of this, an easy example, is the case of tabbing. Now let's bring up one of those documents. Let's enter Word Perfect. Now this is the way we want the paragraph actually to appear. However, you'll see also that there is a tab at the beginning of every line. Now this tab was originally put in at the beginning of every line to convey the intent that we had, which was of blocking the entire paragraph and indenting the entire paragraph. Note, however, what happens in this particular case when we add the word particular to phrase. And you'll see what it does to the text of the paragraph. The reason for this is because of the fact that we retained the tab for each line. We retained information about the formatting on a line-by-line -line basis. If instead we had recorded, as we can now do in modern word processors, the intent of the author at the paragraph level, adding the word particular allows the entire paragraph to be reformatted, which gives us a much more editable document. This means that this paragraph is much more changeable, is much more easily changed, because the intent of the author is retained to go with this paragraph. So, the essence of word processing. Change one thing and everything else changes accordingly. Make your document look any way you want and... And never type anything twice. Really? Well, if you find yourself typing the same thing over and over again, it usually means you're not making full use of your word processing. For example? Well, you should never have to type yours truly twice or your address at the top of the page. So what do you do? You use a macro, short for macroscopic. You record the keystrokes you make in typing your address, say, and then just use a key code next time you want the address. Try it. Move your text down by hitting Enter a few times. 
Open the Tools menu and choose Record Macro. After Record Macro Name, type Address. Tab over to the box opposite Key and type A. Then hit Enter. Whatever you type from now on will be recorded as the Address Macro. You can think of a macro as a little program that will run every time you hit a certain key, or combination of keys. Now, to show that you've finished this particular little program, open the Tools menu again and choose Stop Recorder. My address is stored now? Delete it, and I'll show you. Highlight the text by dragging the cursor across it and hitting the Delete key. Whenever you want it back, just hit Control-Shift-A. Oh, so I'll never have to type my address again. <laughs> Not unless you move. This is too easy. Feel like a bit of cutting and pasting? My favorite sport. All right. Suppose you want to change the paragraphs around. Select the one you want to move and drag the pointer over the paragraph. Click on Edit and Cut. Cut? Whoops. Um... Oh, relax. It's gone into a temporary storage space called the clipboard to paste it somewhere else. Move the pointer to where you want it to go and click on Edit and Paste. Mm, it was better before. Okay. Select the paragraph again, click on Edit and Cut. Put the cursor where you want the paragraph to go and then edit and paste. Now, change the font. Okay. Select the text and choose the typeface you want. Hmm, Times New Roman. Sounds good. Can I change the size too? Oh, sure. Select text again and scroll through the point sizes. 16 point. No, that's too big. Well, actually, you can play with this to your heart's content. Go back to 14 point. Could you do all this with a character-based program? Cut and paste, yes. But changing the look of the screen is something else. This is just plain word perfect for DOS only. To change the font here, you hit Control F8 and 4 for base font. Oh, I see. And you get a choice of several different fonts. But if you change any of these with this non-graphical computer, you won't really see what they look like until you come to print out your document. Whereas with a GUI, what you see as you're typing is what you get. WYSIWYG. I beg your pardon? WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get. What you see on the screen is exactly what you will see when you print out your document. And on this, whatever font or size you choose, you always get this typewriter look? Well, that's what this is, a typewriter-style font. Of course, the quality of what you see on the screen also depends on the quality of your monitor, or CRT, cathode ray tube. Does it work the same as a TV? This is a home television set, and this is a monitor. If you look inside them, in both cases, you'll find something called a cathode, which shoots a stream of electrons, sometimes called a cathode ray, at the back of the video screen. The screen is coated with a special chemical called a phosphor. And a tiny spot of this phosphor will glow whenever it is hit by the electron beam. And it is patterns of various parts of the phosphor that either glow or do not glow that make up the picture that you see on the other side of the screen. The cathode and the phosphor-coated screen are encased in a vacuum tube. And this whole arrangement is called a cathode ray tube, or CRT. So both a TV set and a monitor can also correctly be called a CRT. So much for the similarities between TV sets and monitors. Now for the differences. First difference, the TV set can only cope with information that comes in the form of what are called radio frequency signals, or RF signals. But in order for a computer to put information on a screen, it has to send out what are called video signals. So before information can get from a computer to a TV set, it has to be modulated from video to radio frequency. 
And this is done by an RF modulator. Now for the second difference between a TV set and a monitor. Most TVs are only built to show regular television pictures. They were never intended to display fine detail, in particular, fine print. Although the screen of a TV set may well contain as many pixels as the screen of a monitor, the TV set is simply not designed to turn these pixels on and off as precisely and as rapidly as a monitor is. So if you plug your computer into a TV set and type in some words, the pixels making up the tiny letters will tend to smear and be difficult to read. Whereas if you plug your computer into a monitor with its very precise and rapid control of individual pixels, what you type will be very crisp and clear. That is why, if you have a choice, you should make sure that the CRT into which you plug your computer is a monitor rather than a TV set. WYSIWYG and the Pixels? Sounds like a rock group. Well, rock groups, they come and go, but Pixels are... Oh, please don't say it. Well, the idea behind them has been around a long time anyway. Old-fashioned movie theaters used to have display boards made up of hundreds of electric light bulbs, which could be turned on or off in various patterns to form words or pictures. This is exactly how your computer screen works. If you want to see your name in lights, all you have to do is type it. Because when you type something at the computer, what you're doing in effect is turning on a lot of little points of light on the screen. Each of these points of light is called a picture element, or pixel for short. And the more pixels, the better the resolution? That's right. How many pixels am I getting on this screen? Well, this one can give you up to 1,024 across and 768 down. Which is? 786,432 points of light. Maybe it would look better in two columns. Okay. Click on Format and then on Columns. Number. Two columns and spacing. Half an inch apart seems all right. Wow. Hmm. I should give this a title, shouldn't I? Well, to make it easier to fit the title on top of the two columns, insert a frame to set the title in. Click on Insert and Frame, and drag the pointer down across the screen. Hot air balloon sale. Hmm. That should be in big letters. Well, first click on the edge of the box to select everything inside it. I'll try 42 point. Now, center it. The centering icon is the one beneath the letter icon. All we need now is a picture. Oh, funny you should mention that. To show you how easy it is to stick pictures into text, we just happen to have one in... Microsoft Word? No, in a graphics program. There's one that comes built in with Windows. Do I have to get rid of Word to get it? No, not really. You can have it up on the screen at the same time. Shrink the Word window by clicking on the arrow at the top right corner, way up to the top. And there on the left of your screen is your paintbrush program. Has that been there all the time? You bet. Now, to get our ready-made picture, click on File and Open in Paintbrush and choose the file name Balloons BMP. Balloons Bump? Bump. Oh, well. <clears throat> BMP is simply the name for a certain type of graphics file. Not bad. Now, how do I get it to fly from here to here? Just cut it out and paste it in. See the row of little pictures on the left? Mm -hmm. Click once on the scissors and drag the mouse to enclose the balloon. Ooh, have I cut it out now? You've marked it. You can drag the whole thing around within its window. Well, I'm getting airsick. And into the word window? Well, not quite. First, you copy it into the clipboard. Click Edit and Copy. And now it's in the clipboard? That's right. Now you have to make room for the drawing on your page of text. Click on the little arrow top right of the Word window. Click on Insert and Frame, and open up the frame where you want it to be. You can put it anywhere on the page. Try putting it right in the center. 
and click on Edit and Paste. This is really great. Well, I better save it. Click on File. And save as Balloons. Saved. You should make a backup floppy, just in case. But there's a blank disk you can use. It's already been formatted. Formatted? Well, a floppy disk is a storage device, like a cassette. But the way you access the stuff on it is quite different. The tape in a cassette is like a very long scroll of parchment. The only way to find a particular piece of information is to read through the whole thing from beginning to end. This is because the information is arranged in one long, uninterrupted sequence. You have sequential access to information on a cassette. But a disc, on the other hand, is like a book. You can go directly to any particular piece of information you want, ignoring all the rest of the book. You have random access to information in a book or on a disc. But before you can read or write information in any particular part of a book, you must first number its pages and give it a table of contents. The same goes for a disc. When it's manufactured, it's completely blank. In order for the computer to find its way around the disc, it needs page numbers and a table of contents. Putting this information on the disc is called formatting and usually consists of dividing the disc into a number of tracks, like the chapters of a book, and then dividing each of these tracks into a number of sectors, the pages. One or more of these sectors will be set aside for a table of contents, a catalog. Once a disc is formatted, the computer can randomly access any of its sectors in order to read or write some information. Okay, so this has already been formatted. Now, how do I copy my document from the hard disk onto this? Well, put it into drive B. Get the file manager window up. Get out of the window you're in right now by clicking on file and then close. Click on the file manager icon and there on the right you'll find your balloon stock. Now you just drag it onto the little drawing of disk drive B. Yes, I'm sure. And hey, presto, it's copying your file. So, now my masterpiece is both on the hard disk and on the floppy disk? Well, of course, you could also print it out as well. Oh yeah, I forgot that. Here's a laser printer. Click on file and print. Thanks. It's all set up to go. The computer will now ask you to confirm this. It'll take just a few moments while it sends its instructions to the printer. I wonder how it'll turn out. What you see is what you get. But sharper. You know, I could publish a book right on my desktop. Desktop publishing. What you've done is just the beginning. You can do much more elaborate things and do them much more easily with a dedicated desktop publishing program. The difference between word processing and desktop publishing is that those two types of software are aimed at different audiences. Word processing tends to be aimed towards the way a stenographer would think, putting one page in a typewriter after another, all with a very similar layout. Desktop publishing is more oriented towards the kinds of things a graphic artist would want to do, sitting at a table with a knife, paste, and paper, assembling various elements all over a piece of paper. What I have up on the screen right now is actually the front and back covers of a piece of paper that's meant to be folded as 11 by 17. What I'm going to do is ask the software to turn on block outlines, and we're going to see the various bits and pieces that I have assembled here. This is a text block containing the main title of the piece, a reference to the company that's publishing it. Then on the back cover, we actually have a text block here, 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 and here, all seemingly random on the page. If we look at the inside of the brochure, we see something different again, a text block on the left, 
one on the right, and then running right through the folded part of the paper is an illustration of trees. When you start to lay out something in desktop publishing, you have a vision in your mind first of what you'd actually be doing if you were performing cut and paste. We always have a grid or a set of guides tied to an imaginary ruler. Here we have an invisible grid that's two wide by four deep. Let me just change this to have an inch at the top and the bottom, an inch and a quarter on each side. We'll keep our row spacing and our column spacing. We'll have seven rows and we'll have five columns. There's our new grid. What's the purpose of this? It's to begin to establish our graphic elements. This seemingly simple page actually has a number of graphic elements on it to make it look good. The most interesting of all is where we put the cartoon in the bottom. In fact, the cartoon itself is stored as a separate file, a simple picture. If I just highlight the various elements that are in the cartoon here, we can see by these black handles the various bits and pieces that go to form it together. Interestingly, if we start to move it around on the page, it takes a little while, you can see that the text is now flowing around it wherever it can go. Let's shrink that down a little bit so that I can see the effect on the total page. We'll move it up to the top right here. And somehow that doesn't please me too much. Let's move it down to the lower right. That's an example of advanced typographic control that all desktop publishing packages give you. It's so easy to work with several programs at once. Is this multitasking? Well, not quite. True multitasking is when two or more programs are actually working for you simultaneously. What you've been doing is task switching. Do all computers do task switching? Well, it's much easier with some sort of graphical user interface, a GUI, so you can see your different programs up on the screen at the same time. So the Mac should be good at this. Well, check it out. We have a Macintosh here just for you. Another toy. There's a tiny little on switch at the back on the right. It takes a moment to warm up. And there's your opening screen. It looks much like the Windows screen. It's more the other way around. The Apple Macintosh was the first popular computer with a GUI. Windows only caught on later. Double click on hard disk. This is what you've got on the hard disk. System folder. Is this DOS? Well, it's the operating system, yeah, but on the Mac, it's simply called system. The term DOS has come to be reserved for PCs only. The most popular version being Microsoft DOS or MS-DOS. The same people who make MS Word and MS Windows? That's right. MS Windows is the graphical shell for MS-DOS. But the Mac doesn't have a graphical shell. The Mac operating system itself is graphical. So pictures are woven into the very fabric of the machine. Oh, they'd love you at Apple. Are my Windows programs compatible with the Mac? No, I'm afraid not. The DOS operating system is quite different from the Macs but the Mac makes it even easier to move things around. I'll just show you one example. Click on MS Word. Suppose you want to throw out your odds and end file. You just click on it and drag it to the trash can. Is it gone? Well, to get rid of it completely, you have to click on Special and... Empty Trash. Do I want to permanently remove my odds and ends file? Yes. Okay. It's gone. Great. And you say the Mac is also good at task switching. Uh-huh. But one of the best operating systems for true multitasking on a desktop is the one that comes with some of the IBM computers themselves. There's an IBM right behind you. Wait a minute. I thought PCs like this were copies of IBMs. They are of the original IBM PCs, but now some IBM PCs run their very own operating system, OS2. Again, it looks just like Windows. On the surface, yes, but OS2 is not just a shell like Windows. It's more like the Mac, graphical through and through. 
If I want to use the real IBM, do I have to give up all the Windows programs I've bought for my regular PC? No. No, that's another advantage of OS2. You can run DOS-only programs under it or DOS plus Windows. So, now I've seen four types of what? Operating systems? Well, it's better to call them platforms. DOS, DOS plus Windows, the Mac system, and OS2. OS2 sounds almost too good for words. What's the catch? Well, it requires a lot more RAM memory for one thing, even more than Windows. To take advantage of OS2, you need at least 8 meg of memory. I like this. I'd like to send it to all my friends. I could generate mailing lists with the word processor, couldn't I? Mail merge? Well, we'll be getting to that later. But first, in our upcoming show, we'll take a look at spreadsheets. I'm Billy Venn. And I'm Victoria Stoffel.